Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's webinar, um, where this week we're on such an exciting topic that is bill costs. Uh, and I say that sort of semi lightly. Um, basically, we have um, a situation where bill costs are rising, and ultimately, um, a lot of questions and a lot of uh, interactions I have with various developers and investors at the moment is all around those bill costs are increasing, it's impacting upon the sites, um, where then we need, you know, how best can we, uh, can we keep those costs down? And that's through great quality um, subcontractor management and working with good quality people. And we thought we'd get in some help and support to maybe then uh, give us a bit of an oversight into what the state of the market is right now, and obviously how then best we can, um, we can minimize those costs um, and minimize that spend as we're getting on site. So I would like to introduce um, Paul Hemming from C-Link, who is um, essentially co-founder of C-Link, which is a, a subcontracting platform and uh, basically helps you manage um, your subcontractors, helps you find them, helps you um, manage that tendering process and all of that kind of stuff. And I feel like I'm stealing all of Paul's thunder, um, but I will leave, leave him to maybe uh, explain it in more detail. But prior to that, Paul was uh, managing lots of um, large, um, large scale projects, things like the walkie talkie, things like um, Batsy power station, all that kind of stuff. So again, um, I am, uh, speak on probably his behalf, so I shall uh, I shall let you uh, introduce yourself. Um, are you there, Paul? I am here. I can't um, share my video at the moment. I think you need to. Uh... Oh, there we go. Ah, uh, fantastic, excellent. <laughs> um, Hi, how you doing, Andrew? Yeah, very good. Thanks, very good. Um, how you doing? Very well, thanks. Yeah, not too bad at all. Thank you. Fantastic. Hopefully, I didn't uh, I didn't butcher that, and it was uh, it was the right buildings that you've been working on in the past. Yeah, you were right. It was a lovely introduction, Andrew. <laughs> um, well, just want us just to break a little bit of ice before we really get into it today. Um, do you want to just tell me a little bit about you know obviously um, you know years and years of experience um, within the industry, managing large projects, all of that kind of stuff? What made you then sort of go in and um, and co-found Sealink? Good question. Um, so that is a good question. So I am a quantity surveyor. It's not the coolest of jobs to say that you do, but that's what I uh, trained in. That's what I became. And I was sat in the pub with a good friend of mine who was also a quantity surveyor six, seven years ago. And as you were saying at the time, I was working on Battersea Power Station and the Walkie Talkie. Uh, Chris was working on smaller projects um probably like 20 30 unit projects or, or or below and we both had exactly the same problem with subcontract procurement at that time where we just couldn't find the right contractors for, for the job despite i was working for a two billion pound company um worldwide chris was working for a slightly different company but we found it incredible that we were in this position and uh, uh we decided to do something about it fantastic i'd like to say actually chris decided to do something about it i just jumped on his coattails <laughs> very modest as well then we clearly was saying um fantastic so today then what we have is a bit of a session um understanding where we are with the market um then some hopefully helpful um tips and advice from paul and the team there um, around trying to sort of minimize those costs and then we thought we'd try and bring it to life a little bit with a bit of a um a case study as well so um well, well, we'll have an example work through that you can see where someone's, you know, obviously developed out a scheme and we can then maybe have a look and think, how would we approach that, you know, with the, um, you know, with our bill costs and how we can try and minimise those. So um, I think other than that, if I stop sharing then, Paul, I think it's, it's over to you then. And um, Sure, let me try and share my screen. Your presentation. So can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> okay, so... Hello everyone, as Andrew so kindly introduced me, my name is Paul and I am the co-founder of C-Link. C-Link is a software company at its heart and what we've produced is software that allows property developers or main contractors to procure subcontract trades or to even procure main contract trades. Um, and that means that we have a really good angle on 
construction costs. We see trends. We see what property developers are doing. We see what main contractors are doing. And we've got a really good view on construction costs. Now, I don't think this is news to anyone, particularly given Andrew's introduction, but the landscape for construction costs is not a pretty one right now. So the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, their latest report, which came out in October, showed that in September 2021, we were a full 23.6% ahead of where we were in September 2020. That is absolutely astronomical. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the more worrying thing being about it is that actually by the, the same metrics from July 2020 to July 2021, it was 20%. So in, in the months between, we've actually grown a further three, almost 4%, which is pretty alarming. The uh, CMPI is at its highest uh, point since records began. And just to give some flavor, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, understanding of this out there um, for everyone listening, but some of the prices that have gone up, plywood has gone up 82%, steel has gone up 65%, and plain wood has gone up 64% as well. So that's just shows you the real extent of the problem that we're dealing with. Why is this happening? Again, this is not um, rocket science. I think everyone knows that because of the pandemic and the supply fact the impacts that came with that, obviously mills, factories were shut down. Um, and because of Brexit, 60% or so of UK construction products come from the EU. And obviously there's additional, I'm not going to talk about Brexit, but there's additional uh, factors which make that process a bit more um, challenging to get materials in. So it's kind of like the perfect storm really, of supply and a complete lack of supply. Factor into that as well that you have also a raw materials issue. Again, there's a global shortage of raw materials because of the pandemic and other um, factors which is causing us problems. And in addition, the UK then has a particular shortage of labour and a particular shortage of logistics. We saw the logistics with what happened with... Uh, the petrol crisis in September and October. I came back from holiday to an empty tank of petrol, so don't start me on that. Um, so I was stuck. Um, but also in terms of labour and construction, there were 43,000 construction vacancies in between July and September, and that was the first time the figure has ever risen above 40,000, according to the ONS. So we are in a real, real pickle, guys, to say, to say the least. Um, how's okay. everyone... Sorry, Andrew. Did you want to thanks, for this, thanks for this rosy picture, Paul. I think this I is know, you know, I'm everyone pick, you, better, pick everyone up on a uh, <laughs> Tuesday afternoon. Um, in terms of how the industry is feeling, um, so the Federation of Master Builders revealed that 97% of its members are experiencing construction costs in 2021, and nine out of 10 material suppliers expect costs to increase further in 2022. Now, don't get too alarmed. I'm going to come on to that shortly. Um, in terms of reaction, and uh, th this this I find interesting, and obviously, given that C Link is a procurement marketplace for property developers and contractors to engage, we we really start to see how people are interacting. And obviously, I haven't gone through this in the past as a professional when I was doing procurement myself. But one thing that is really interesting that we have seen is everyone will remember. The start of the pandemic going to a supermarket and seeing no toilet roll on the shelves and seeing all kinds of empty shelves now we have actually started to witness a similar type of behavior manifesting itself in construction and in real estate whereby people are just trying to mass stock uh, products now there was one of our clients property developer small medium-sized property developer they're doing 10, 11 units in London, actually. And their de-risk strategy was, even though they were only just coming out of the ground at this, when I was speaking to them a couple of weeks ago, um, and therefore you would typically be procuring the steel work, the brick work, the windows at that point, they had already procured all of those materials and were at the point where they were actually doing the flooring, tiling and painting. So there were some six, seven months in advance pre-procuring to lock in and as they saw it, reduce their risk today by locking in today's price because they their view was that prices are going to continue to go up now i think prices are going to continue to go up but whether that is the strategy that i would employ i'm not 100 sure but panic buying does seem to actually be a little bit 
of seeping into the mentality. Now, with that in mind, and with the fact that I'm not sure that that is the best strategy to take, I wanted to look at a forecast for 2022 first, and then actually for all the way to 2025. Now, ING, the bank, anticipate that it will take until at least the summer of 2022 before the price of the majority of like core building products starts to taper and come down. So concrete, bricks, cement, the vast majority of what you're spending your money on when you're procuring construction works, they're going to stay on the rise, even if it's just a gradual rise all the way through to the summer of 2020. 22, sorry. Um, but for me, and this is kind of what I wanted to evidence to everyone listening, the price of lumber or the price of timber um, for me is a good way to contextualize what is actually happening in the market. So this graph that I'm about to show you is actually the graph of it's the lumber future index. And it shows you the period of 2017 through to 2022. And you can see a drastic spike already. But let's just talk about that and try to actually understand what it means for our feeling today and maybe for our feeling tomorrow. So if we look at first the period of 2017 through to pre-pandemic, the end of 2019 here, you'll see that basically the price ranges between 250 and 550 per thousand board feet um, in dollars. And it's pretty consistent. It goes up and down, but you'll see that it's nothing drastic. That's kind of how we have all procured in the past. That's everything that we know effectively. At the start of the pandemic, life changes. Obviously, we have this big drop off when all the uh, demand drops. But then as we kind of come out of lockdown number one and enjoy that lovely summer um, that we did, you'll see that the price actually starts to go up and the price goes up to $900, which is effectively double the point it was pre-pandemic, it's a 2x. Um, and that's largely because there's not much supply, but demand goes up. We then have a bit of a drop off as we all go back into lockdown, sadly having to reminisce about all of this guys, but go back into lockdown. And then as the vaccine starts to roll out, you'll then see that you just have this crazy surge through the back end of 21, all the way through the start of 20, or through the start of 21, sorry, to a peak here which is in May 2021, where the price was $1,670 per thousand board feet, which is a 4x from the start of the pandemic. So absolutely insane numbers. And you can just see by the, by the look of this, just how insane that actual, the graph is. That was an all-time peak. And you'll actually see that we've recovered relatively quickly into the back end of the summer. And we're now ranging between 500 and 750 so still high but actually these are the numbers that are not dissimilar to what we've experienced before now it's for that reason that i call into question whether stockpiling materials today or over the last few months is actually a good strategy because all of your suppliers are buying it or have bought at the top and are currently selling to you right now based on based on that so as things start to ease out, yes, right, prices are still higher than we would have anticipated pre-pandemic, but pricing should ease out. So my view would be that it should start to really simplify in 2022 and beyond. And that's kind of hopefully what this should contextualise for everyone listening. I don't know what you think, Andrew. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think um, I think you're right. There's always going to be that that point. You know, I think what what's probably also fed into that that peak as well as as like I say once. You know, and I know this from from uh, my ex colleagues um, and some of the people that I've I've dealt with in terms of PLCs, and obviously they're dealing across hundreds of sites across the UK. They've all stopped, and then they've all started around the same time, or or at least certainly reduced mm -hmm. in in, um, in sort of building rate, and then and then obviously then try to ramp up all at the same time. And, right. and I think there's a, there's a combination of that. Whereas I think now. There seems to be that more of an understanding, I think, across the country. I mean, you know, fingers crossed with, with Omicron, but um, there seems to be that understanding of like, we've just got to keep going with this, you know, so I think there won't necessarily be that sudden drop off and a sudden spike up again. Right. I think it is it is just going to, it'll find its level. It might be slightly higher than it was before, but I think I think you're right. It's going to just find that find that level and hopefully that panic buying, you know, it doesn't. Um, exactly, you know, yeah. 
I mean, that's that's definitely obviously we see lots of procurement strategies going on for different house builders and different uh, developers. And the summer, probably from the spring to the summer, was absolutely insane for the volumes of procurement that were happening, and everyone was playing catch up. Um, and I think that manifests itself in the demand that you're seeing and then the price uh, going up to some degree obviously there's other factors as well but um i do think things are starting to level out again and that shows on this graph i suppose you know what tends to drive like you said is there's those short-term supply demand issues but would you say there's anything fundamentally restricting you know i guess supply you know i guess you know we're getting better aren't we with um you know there's no fuel crisis anymore and all of that kind of stuff but it's we're, we're getting a little bit less constrained, I would say, with those sort of supply. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it certainly seems so. You had, so you had raw materials not going to factories. Factories weren't open. They then had to pay catch up. And then we had we have all the extra issues around Brexit and getting 60% of materials into the country. And then we have our own logistic issues as well. So it, without repeating myself, it is literally the perfect storm. But... As every day goes past, that balances out something. It, it, it does feel like with, we're getting better, you know, like I say, as suppliers get better at dealing with trade, you know, given the current environment and all of that kind of stuff, then then hopefully, um, like I say, I think it's just going to find that level, you know, hopefully back <clears> to, to what it was. But if not, you know, I think, and I think the key thing with a lot of development work is, is that just consistency, you know, I think, it, you know, if it just stays at a slightly higher level, as long as you're buying sites on the basis of that's what the build costs are, and then you get to actually see out that build on that basis, then that's fine, isn't it? You know, and even if they shoot up next time, well then, you know, it's just that consistency, that's the key. Whereas, yeah, you buying a site, <laughs> expecting the price to be here, and then by the time you actually go and procure your materials, you're going to be all the way up here, then then that's that's not so good. So hopefully, or, or buying all of your materials on day one because you're panicking again, perhaps not necessarily the best strategy because yeah, um, things are improving. I think so. That so that means if there is a, some sort of another lockdown <coughs> and toilet roll shortage, you think we should be checking site cabins for um, you know for just go on to sites. They're all there. Yeah, you'll yeah. see it. Yeah, in lockups, it's everywhere. There's bricks everywhere. <laughs> Honestly, it's, yeah, I, I was quite shocked by that uh, strategy, but I, it, it, to some degree, it makes sense. But turning then to 2022 and beyond, and so looking at the future, and what I'm about to show you is BCIS, RICS data. It's like their all-in tender price index and their forecast for the years ahead. So really just focusing on the yellow and the orange for the sake of our conversation, which is the cost of building and the cost of all in tender prices. So what, including the labor and absolutely everything else. So you'll see that 2021, we were at about 4% for both. In 2022, they are forecasting this, this drop off. So the cost of building will not be what it was in 2021 because it's been alarming as we've just discussed. Um, but then beyond that, tender prices are in 22, 23, 24 and 25 still going to increase at a relatively standard level. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and roughly in those four years, we're looking at a uh, 14, 15 percent um, increase in tender price and building costs. So it, this isn't something which is going to go away. Um, and go flat, but we knew that before the pandemic, honestly. Our business plan was actually written on the basis that uh, material price and building costs are going up. It's just that 2021 has just led us to this drastic position where for, there's been this bottleneck and that has happened. But long term, building prices are going up. And for me, this long term view calls for a long term strategy. We work with a lot of property developers who have started to adjust the way that they are working um, in terms of construction, taking a more lean construction procurement focus. And in doing that, we see, and this isn't something that has necessarily come in short term, this is more of a medium term focus, if you like, which is kind of rethinking the way that you do traditional procurement um, and moving away from always building every project design and build or the traditional model if you like and actually perhaps focusing on self-build focusing on the fact that um, building some construction expertise in-house because um, 
we do see that if materials and building costs is going to continue to grow up, uh, go up, sorry, it's a good idea to actually take control of that cost, take that expertise in house. And in doing so, you can effectively employ project management team or a project manager QS in lieu of employing the main contractor. And in doing so, there is a way that you can reduce the cost by 10 to 20% kind of quite simply in terms of reducing the cost. I'm not suggesting for a minute that the actual transition away from employing a main contractor to doing it yourself is a simple process. That is a process which is both risky um, and challenging and requires a human resource, like I said, project management team. But what we have seen um, this year and what we have seen in the years prior is that because there is this forecast growth in construction costs, developers um, are looking at leaner ways of doing things. And one way of doing that is uh, by managing the construction themselves, something we call self-build. And we talk about that quite a lot, Andrew, on our uh, podcast. We talk about the rights and wrongs of it, the actual numbers around it. And I think that there is plenty um, of food for thought there um, for developers. Yeah, I suppose um, I suppose just in, in my head, and I guess for any sort of you know regular Nimbus users, you know, self-build being more you know, Joe Blogs themselves going out and, and building their own house, you mean that more as just bringing that, um, managing that build sort of in-house. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the, the quantity surveyors nerdy way of uh, describing it or the way that we were taught it was that you have traditional construction procurement, you have design and build procurement, there's others, you have management contracting or you have construction management. What we're advocating here is construction management, which is effectively developer has some sort of in-house construction resource which allows them to manage that process themselves without necessarily employing a main contractor to do it and therefore removing main contractors overhead and some of the main contract prelim as well because effectively as a uh, developer and this is very headline term so don't hold me, hold me to this but if you're spending a million pounds building and you're giving it to a main contractor that will be made up roughly of eight hundred thousand pounds of subcontract costs hundred thousand pounds of prelims which is ma main contractor management and a hundred thousand pounds let's say of main contractor profit you could remove the profit and then at the same time perhaps enjoy a employer project manager and still save some money as well uh, that way and then um thereby reducing those uh, costs moving forward which is why i say and that that is a long term or a medium term play um but i think that is something that a lot of smart developers are doing and we see it I suppose that's, yeah, I guess the, you know, it's sort of dipping your toe in that, I guess, is there a sort of, you know, is there baby steps approach to, you know, to getting there or is it, have you just got to sort of bite the bullet on the next project and say. It's that, that's a really good question. That's a, something that we've debated with people who have done it. Uh, something that we have debated ourselves internally as to what is the best way to do it. Now, I think a really good way to do it and to dip your toe in is kind of towards the back end of a project where you are employing main contractor or you're doing things the traditional way, let's call it, then perhaps employing either a project manager in-house or even like a consultant project manager to kind of oversee that and actually start to give you advice on how they would do things. And then you, you, you start to soak that up and you can even employ, rather than employing a project manager on PAYE, potentially employ a project manager as a consultant. We speak a lot on our podcast to uh, just different development finance people who are starting to become more comfortable with the fact that you can have a successful project with construction management rather than just design and build, which kind of is uh, what we have done up to this point. So does, does this mean the, the the end to all main contractors? Then are they, you know, are they uh, they all I, get down? I suppose I hope there's none listening because I think that I'm talking nonsense here, but <laughs> I, I don't think that it does. I really don't think it does. I really think design and build and main contracting genuinely has its place. However, I personally feel more and more that for developers who are facing this pinch on their bottom line and will continue to do so, I've just shown you where the numbers are going over the next three or four years, there's got to be a way to uh, manage construction costs because they're just going to keep going up. It's happened for the life of our business so far for five years. Construction costs just compound go up. I think every developer is feeling those tighter margins, aren't they? So I think, personally speaking, that simply employing the main contractor, simply employing the standard traditional procurement is something that 
can be thought about more and there are alternative routes for some projects absolutely design and build is right the problem is that for some projects absolutely construction management is right but we're just doing design and build mm, yeah yeah and, and, and to be honest I, I can say that you know if i look to, to some of the larger schemes even as a um you know my previous experience with a plc developer um you know we'd have large schemes where they say we've got to build schools we've got to build um you know commercial units and all of that kind of stuff and and typically then they would be um you know design a build contract you know for a, for a school because ultimately it doesn't lie within the plc house builder developer you know mm -hmm. sort of standard operation of, of construction so i think you know applying that you'd almost say look you know what's What's your bread and butter you can almost start to sort of bring in you know if you're just building a, a couple of standard sort of houses that you've done before maybe then you could start to sort of bring that in in house if all of a sudden you're doing some more complicated conversion or you know some new you know block of apartments and you're going up six seven stories that you've never done before then then potentially then you'd be looking you know absolutely at, you know yeah and I, I mean the, the other thing about um I actually am a bit of an advocate for design and build in the right context. But the, the, the other thing about design and build is that not only do you pay more generally um, as, a, as a smaller developer, but you actually also hand over the keys, don't you, to, to the design and to the product and say, over to you, uh, Mr. Contractor. So the alternative is that you can take on a bit more risk, yes, but reduce the cost and grab hold of the quality and grab hold of the design and deliver the product that you want to deliver, which is why I see this with some of the developers that we know that are doing this and they get great results from it. Mm, fantastic. And I suppose one of the quick point I would like to add in terms of how to defend against this, I suppose, is just minimizing those prelims and uh, just getting through projects, you know, quicker, basically, which I know is easier said than done, but um you know i know that was always one thing we would always look at certainly that appraisal stage is always then saying right you know have we got that program um as tight as we possibly can because like i say every day you're on there it's just mm. costing you you know that bit more isn't it so um another one to to think about as well yeah and uh, i couldn't agree with you more and again if you're doing the construction management approach without laboring this point you're actually able to get it done much more quickly because you're tendering the chunks you're going to do like ground and frame tender it that gets on on site then you focus on the envelope then you focus on the fit out whereas main contract you're just going to tender it for a long period at the start not going to get any gains of placing it and getting on with it so it's a longer tender period and it will generally take longer to mm. complete the procurement and delivery but that's all i've got to say on my um lovely little uh, presentation a bit. Well, i suppose uh, stop sharing my screen. we yeah yeah we were going to open up to q a at the end i guess since these sort of relate a little bit to this section before we'll open it up um later on as well but mm -hmm. um kelvin asked is steel following a similar trend to timber uh it's slightly different um they're not all the same but yes i mean that is as i understand it they they are all following a relatively similar trend because all of it is supply and demand driven and complete lack of supply at those certain crucial moments led to that spike in the price. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then um, I was asked, uh, do you think <clears throat> maybe cladding problems uh, is from d &B contracts where contractor was unable to cut the cost? I'm not quite sure uh, um, what he means by that question. I suppose... I suppose all these cladding problems, I think we're probably less probably around costs and more people didn't realize, or as, as I understand it, more around people just didn't realize the sort of the fire risk against. I them. mean, design, just for a bit of context, the so design and build contracts were originally brought in for um, and have been butchered how they're using. So they're originally bought in for a client who wants to build, for example, a warehouse. So they want, I don't know, 10,000 square foot warehouse. They want it to have a U value of X and they want it to look semi-decent, right? You would just go out to tender, and then the tenders would design and build it, and they'd say, I'm going to use this product, I'm going to use this product, I'm going to use this product, um, and it would come back at a competitive tender, and you'd just choose because you don't really care as the client because you are just you just want it designed and built for you at the most economical price. Design and build now, 20, 30 years on, is being used for where there's a specification, and it's just not quite being used as it was originally intended whether or not that's um when you talk about 
the issue with the cladding, whether that was what drove that, I'm not 100% sure, um, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, and then the final one before we go into this um, worked example, and we'll sort of bring a bit of bring all this to life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chris has asked, what would you say the percentage split is on procurement routes today compared to, say, 12 months ago? The split between design and build and construction management, self-delivery. Obviously, I only have a handle on uh, projects that I see uh, and it's ever increasing uh, through ceiling. But that is to say we are a platform where you can do the self-build construction management approach. So we're obviously quite biased about it. What I will say through conversations with uh, people in development finance is that in the last 12, 18 months, there has been a shift now where um, I think rather than it being 80% of uh, development finance insisting roughly that you have to have DMB, they won't look at any, and then 20% of the more entrepreneurial development finance can be saying that they would consider self-build. I spoke with one the other day who said that they now have if you have a project manager in-house versus design and build, it's 50-50. So more and more development finance and lenders are actually open to the possibilities of it. The actual data on what the industry is doing is harder for me to uh, answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. The so, trend is towards construction management, though, is my feeling. Yeah, in the, in the sort of longer term, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, fantastic. So let's have a look and sort of bring a scheme to life. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'll do is I'll share my screen um, and work through this. And for those um, of you who haven't seen Nimbus before, um, this is Nimbus Maps and Nimbus Maps is a tool to help um, developers and investors find sites, assess them, and then connect with the relevant stakeholders. And today, uh, I could pretend and, and arbitrarily find one, but I think to, to, to make sure that the, this uh, worked example works, we have found a particular site um, down in, in Croydon, but to be honest, we came there because I seem to speak to a few people who are all looking around Croydon. And ultimately, you know, in terms of, of those ways of finding those sites, We've got Elite Plus strategies, which can help you. If you're looking for a big back garden that you want to then knock down a house and build something else in its place, these are the kind of things which are then going to help you find um, those kind of strategies and ultimately those kind of sites where then we can then obviously have a look in and sort of say, okay, great. You know, we've got, you know, 1.3 acres. We could carve that up, get another half an acre there and we could build sort of three or four houses in its place or, you know, an extra one in there. And to sort of prove that point, uh, one of the ways, obviously, we're looking for schemes that are developed out so we can sort of almost go through the journey and sort of show you that sort of step by step of trying to sort of minimize those costs through that sort of initial stage right the way through to then obviously uh, being out on site. So to find one that's already sort of been there, we can put on the, um, the planning overlay. This is showing us those uh, planning applications, these sort of red dots, they're residential development. And we can see, um, as you can see, I've sort of zoomed in on one, which is gonna be the focus point today, which is um, this particular site here, which if we bring up the details, um, is 43 Downsway, um, which if I just bring up the planning again, so looking at the planning, you can see they've been discharging a lot of conditions. So this is something which they are working on. We can even see from the Google map that they've actually started to develop out this site. But the key um, application here is um, demolition of existing building and erection of a two-story building with accommodation of roof space and the basement. So I think that's a lovely planning trick to say you're only doing a two-story building with four stories of, um, of habitable space, uh, including a various flats. So Let's just say we were going around, we were finding this plot, you know, we've submitted our planning application, we've suddenly um, been granted planning, we're now in discussion with the landowner, what on earth are we going to pay for this particular site, you know, we had an auction agreement that if we did get planning, we'd then agree what the, what the price was, or if this happened to come to the market, how, how do we go about, you know, coming up with a price to be able to bid for this compared to everyone else if, if suddenly this um, site had come on the market. So first things first, we want to have a look and see what we're actually pricing up, which we can come to the register here, uh, look up the details of the scheme, and we can see here that probably the key one really are sort of floor plans, 
So that was the ground floor, and it looks like we've got some more floor plans here as well, which um, if we, yeah, so we can see here. So this, this one, I think, is the ground floor, I think it is. So this is the ground floor. So now we can see, I mean, obviously, if you are um, a QS like Paul, then you're probably going around and, and counting up all the flagstones and all of the bushes that have been sort of proposed. But ultimately, to get that initial steer, all we're effectively doing is saying, OK, we know it's um, essentially a, uh, a very big house, essentially, with sort of two stories with a room in the roof, but ultimately with a load of um, apartments here. And now we can start to pick out, right, well, we know unit two is 71 square metres, unit three is 71 square metres. And we can work through the rest of the floors, unit seven, 61, unit four, 71, etc. You know, if we come up here, there's another one up here as well, that's 71 units. Unit one seems to be right in the... Is that the, that was like the basement or something, isn't it? Is that the, yeah, the lower ground floor? So just to make this a little bit easier, rather than trying to sort of talk through all the numbers so that everyone's got them in their heads, I have just drafted a very, very simple calculator here. And to save everyone's time, there were, uh, sorry, this was, five um, times 71 square meter um, apartments plus two um, times 61 square meter apartments, which is resulting in 5,134 square feet of habitable space. Um, now, obviously, I know there's circulation space and everything else, but for, for, for the, this just headline um, appraisal, we're just going to sort of base it on that, which then we want to come down into um, revenues, bill costs and profits very quickly on revenues before then we'll hand over to Paul, who can then help us out with the bill cost revenues. We do have a comparables tool um, and for anyone on Nimbus, watch out um, on Monday where this uh, completely changes and becomes much better. But simply, if we want to find what are residential values in this area, we can simply toggle that on. And then it's going to highlight all the properties. If I get rid of the planning now, it's highlighting all the properties surrounding here, which has sold in the past two years. And we can click on any one of those particular properties, scroll down to that price paid information, and then we can see that one sold is 645,000. Now that is um, on the basis that it's um, a house. Obviously we could then filter this down on the basis that it's flats. And we might want to then look a little bit further back because um, there doesn't seem to be many going on around here. Maybe we'll search a little bit further and wider. And now we can pick out some more. And clearly it's highlighting that property there. So they've obviously started to, to sell some flats, but there's obviously some flats in and around some of these other ones here as well. Um, 706, that does look like a house rather than the flats. I wonder if it's then sub been subdivided. But that's coming out of 300 pound a square foot. You know, if we just keep this nice and simple, that is not coming up with a square footage. What's this one coming out at as well? Uh, that's coming out of 500 pound a square foot. If we just want to get a bit of a headline steer, we can toggle this on as well. It's coming out of 461 pound a square foot. So for our appraisal, it sounds like it's probably going to be somewhere between 461 pound a square foot and that 500. But just to just to start that appraisal off, we're going to look at um, on this basis for now. So now we have our revenue, which if we filter that out is our nine apartments, which I suppose if we divide that by nine, um, we can see 263,000 doesn't seem too unrealistic. Um, at £461 a square foot, and that gets us our revenue. We would obviously do more work. I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious of, um, of everyone else running through this. More than happy to go through these in demonstrations of how we can then really get you some particular values um, around a particular site. But that's ultimately going to get us our revenues, you know, with, a, with a, obviously a bit more work around there. Uh, whoops. And then with the Excel... The next line in here is then we need to know what our bill cost is and then we can then work out our profit and then we can then start working out a land value accordingly to which point 
typically bill costs, I would have said somewhere in the order of 175 pound a square foot or something. Um, I will probably hand it over to you, Paul, because this is when where ceiling comes in quite handy to, to give you that initial steer, isn't it? You seem to be on mute there. Sorry, my bad. Yes. So I actually, um, so yes, absolutely. We can come in and do the, uh, give you a bit more of a steer on the construction costs. I actually ran this earlier and I had a slightly different um, GIA to you, uh, Andrew. So um, okay. I'm not sure exactly why, but I think I've got a slightly different one um, to you on that. But let me share my screen and just kind of explain how you can use um, ceiling in these very early stages um, to kind of assess. Am I sharing my screen? Okay. Oops. Just uh, share that. It should be ceiling cost planning tool. Uh, you've got your website up there now. Yeah. So, and it says yeah. get started now, right? So, yeah, yeah. Obviously, um, we are in a position where we have got lots of live construction data um, here and now, so we know what things are costing by dry lining, steel work, et cetera, today. Um, so we have created a cost planning tool, which is free for anyone to use. Come through to the website here, ceiling.com forward slash cost planning tool. And what you can do is you can do indicative early cost um, analysis. Now, um, going with the example that Andrew has chosen, what you do is you effectively fill out this questionnaire. I'm gonna skip through lots of it for obvious reasons. We haven't got all day, but you see, you're asked what type of building is it? Is it new build? Is it existing? What kind of structure? Let's say we're gonna do a traditional build with this brick and block type of foundation. You're then asked, is there a basement? Yes or no, I think there is on this one, isn't there? Yeah. So you can say yeah. yes, obviously that impacts the construction costs. Is there any piling? There's probably likely to be some given that there is a basement. So let's say yes. Um, and then you're asked about spec. So again, our product will work. So if you choose low, medium, mid to high or ultra high, this is Croydon. So I'm going to say uh, mid spec, uh, roughly. I think it's probably about right. Maybe mid to high, depending on the development. Are there any lifts? There probably aren't any lifts on this. Or uh, well, there's, there is, it does look like there's a lift on the, on the plans, but you know. Okay. Yes. Let's, put, let's put in a lift. Um, but you see, these are all things which really impact the fundamental cost of your build. You put in the postcode, so I think this was CR20, and it was 43 downs away, wasn't it? So if we put that in yeah. there, and then go next, talk about the location of the project, so it's in the southeast, and then an approximate start date. So again, obviously, with costs ever fluctuating, the start date of the site will impact the work somewhat. So let's put January the 1st, let's get people in on New Year's Day. Why not? Um, so then next step is to put in the GIA. So I'm going to put in the one that I had, Andrew, but let's just... I think I've, I don't know whether I've pulled up the... I think maybe I included all the um, the extra space and everything in before, whereas I'm just... Perhaps I'm not sure, but um, I don't think it matters too much anyway, because... Um, so I think there was a 45 square meters of uh, communal, wasn't there? So let's put that in. But you put in effectively different elements, then decide, put in details of who you are. So I'll just put that in, Paul Henry, and send for the cost breakdown. So I appreciate I have rushed through that quite quickly, um, but you can quite quickly um, do the cost breakdown. And I will now have received uh, shortly, let me pull that up. The financial appraisal for the project yep so it's now in my inbox and again this is indicative but it is based on actually the data that comes through from live cost so you see based on a slightly larger square meter agenda before you fall out and get terrified about um the the overall number so it summarizes absolutely everything here and then you'll see that it actually gives you a detailed breakdown it includes preliminaries and it includes a contingency as well of the um overall project and by my GIA uh, which TBC whether or not that's correct correct Andrew but <laughs> I get to more square foot and I'm actually showing 184 pounds and 58 square foot um, overall cost for that that's, well, that's fine what's your GIA what is it in square meters I think was it 644 six yeah 664 so, six, six, well we yeah. can we can update mine. So I will let you start sharing again. But yeah, effectively, rather than the 100, and that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So you were showing kind of like your typical 175 a square foot. We are telling you that 
today everything is costing you that little bit more and it's coming out at 184 pounds and 58 pence per square foot yeah which i mean to be honest like you say that um and i'll share this spreadsheet so we can see all the numbers in there um the you know ultimately like you say that 175 figures just you know it's just anecdotal it's just getting you in that sort of right kind of ballpark what it allows you to do is then you know without having to run any numbers and, and obviously or, or a tool like c-link you can just sort of go well look you know what's the what's the, the property owner asking are they asking for a million pound quick some figures yeah 175 180 whatever you know is that coming out at the right kind of figure mm -hmm. ultimately then you know we've got the, the profit which typically for developers somewhere in the order of sort of 25 percent on that gdv so then in, uh, on this basis we're doing the 25 percent of that gdv which we can also work out um, per square foot as well. So now what we have, if we expand that out, is we now have a, a land value of 1.1 million pound, uh, or just over 1.1 million. That's on the basis that we can then get a 25% margin. But obviously that, you know, so depending on how um, this site has come about, um, you know, we obviously found this as a planning application. It's a planning application from 2017. But say this was your planning application and you're speaking directly with that landowner, what are we then going to offer that landowner? We're probably not going to offer the same level. The beauty with this one is we can actually see what this particular developer has paid. And even though they got their planning in 2017, we can see they eventually bought it in 2019 um, for 870,000. So even our appraisal here, you know, and that's using 161, so that's the average in the area. That wasn't, you know, maybe picking out some of those higher revenue values, although we did only put a mid price in for the costs as well. So again, it's that balance, isn't it, about saying, well, if I build it a high spec, do I then get closer to 500 pound a square foot? But then this is going to go more like 194 or something, you know, but it does generate more value if we can achieve those figures. And we can see here, so... Um, whoever did buy this, and I would probably suggest it was off market at 870, that's probably the price of, of a house plus a bit of uplift at the time. Uh, but actually you could see that they could probably make a, make a land value work at 1.15. So now you've got extra money in the profit or a bit of extra, um, flow for the, for the bill cost as well. And a bit of risk, uh, money in case things do suddenly shoot up as well. But we can take this one step further um, and ultimately, so say we've bought the site, you know, so I mean, I suppose, um, you know, I don't know whether we can, I won't play around with it and put in 870, but then say we put in 870, uh, we could probably just play around with this figure um, and get that to sort of. Lovely looking job, isn't it? Oh, there we go. See a little bit of uh, expert playing around. I've done this many times trying to get to a bit of uh, a level. So now we're at 34%. Um, but now obviously we want to get on site and we want to try and minimize those costs and keep those costs to, to an absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. And that's where then, um, Paul, you can help as well. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously I've shown you the cost planning tool, which is effectively a tool which we have built off the back of our primary function, which is going back to me being a QS in the pub that day, being frustrated with being able to find the right trades and the right people for my job. Um, so we've actually built a tool that allows you to manage the procurement. So I just want to walk you through how you would potentially do that now that you've gone ahead on the site and you say we're going to build how you would potentially do that. So on day one of your project, you would come through to C-Link and you would set up the project and you would plan your project now if you were to hand the job to me as a qs to manage the job for you i would probably look at the drawings print off the drawings and say okay there's this type of roofing there's this type of cladding whatever whatever and i would put together the right documents so i could create tenders uh, for you that process is something that we have automated so you would effectively create a project profile you then come through and upload your files and rather than our system um read it rather than a qs reading through all of that process effectively what we would have is that you upload your drawings i'll do this on a slightly different uh, project actually um but you upload your drawings and our system will read them and tell you exactly what you need to procure so you see i upload my drawings here and then when i come through 
it tells me in this circumstance that I've got all of these different potential packages to procure. So it kind of alleviates a lot of the front end quantity surveying work. And then in our example, I'm going to keep it nice and simple. And I am going to procure three packages. So I'm going to do envelope and roof, fit out package, and then a ground working frame. So I don't want to have 20 trades on the job. I only want to have three. You put in the dates that you want the price back, the dates that you roughly want to start. So I press save packages, press publish to subcontractors. And at that point, any envelope contractors, fit out contractors or groundwork contractors in that area would receive a notification. They would then be alerted and would be able to say, oh, there's a project that starts in January. They want the price back by Christmas. I can do all of that. Register interest. When you register interest, you then come through to your procurement schedule the following day as the buyer. And you would see that you've got various different contractors who are interested. And the idea being that you've always got three or four interested, suitable, qualified contractors who want to tender on your project. So in terms of who these contractors are, and this is a really big point for us, we're trying to be the opposite of Google or the opposite of the yellow pages. We want to be a filter for the industry and only bring through really, really good contractors. So 98% of contractors aren't suitable for C-Link and we're taking through 2%. And so we get... Uh, portfolio we interview them we get references and then we get all of the boring details as well so all contractors will have a pre-qualification pack like this where you have all the key information on them all their accreditations insurance it's all very boring stuff guys but it means that anyone who is listed sorry where was i listed for you here is someone that we recommend so effectively it's scaled word of mouth recommendations we've then created a way to really streamline the way that you would create inquiry documents. I'm not going to go through the whole process, but you would go here, create an inquiry document, and you would have a document created that looks something like this. So again, it's the way of standardizing invitation to tenders. So it asks you questions that a QS would usually ask themselves, and it goes through this process of creating a standard form document, appending all your drawings and appending all of your specs. And then you're able to send and issue your inquiries really quickly. Idea being that within the first few days of your project, you're actually able to tender absolutely everything. Now, obviously, 43 Downsway is not a project where we have data. Um, so I couldn't tell you what that was actually going to cost if it was competitively tendered through ceiling. But we have lots of projects in and around the area. So I've used data from that to then show you kind of what it would probably look like if it had been tendered through ceiling. So you would then have sent out your inquiries and be receiving prices back. And you'd come through here to quotes and tender analysis. And you would start to see what your budget cost was, which is 1.3 and uh, 184. And you'd actually start to see what the market is saying for these actual packages. Now, because we filtered out so, so much of the industry, we've, we feel like we've got the good guys and all of our guys are encouraged to value engineer. They're all aware that they're in this competitive space, but getting exclusive access to projects. And you can see that against every single package, you're actually able to make gains and savings. So in short, rather than spending your 1.3, which was the 184 pound cost appraisal, which was done at the very start, you're actually able to competitively tender and potentially save between five and 10%, which means Andrew, that your delightful 174 or 175 square foot uh, forecast is actually achievable if you then are competitively tendering in this environment. So yeah, that's what I wanted to explain and what I wanted to uh, show you. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And I suppose, yeah, so now I've, I've put that back in, I've also taken on board um, a couple of comments because quite rightly, clearly everyone is a lot more on the ball than I am. Um, there is going to be um, a lot of SDLT, finance costs, and, and all of those kind of costs. I suppose you've got, you know, if, you, if you're working with an agent selling all your, your units, you'll have all of those costs as well. So I've just put in a very crude discount to, to minute back to a, um, to a value that you maybe actually pay rather than what you, uh, than this gross land value here. So uh, thank you to the, to the two or three people who quite rightly pointed out I was about to lose some of my margin uh, for not taking into account my costs. So, uh, you know. Julie uh, slapped on the wrist there. Uh, what I have done is, is put in the put in the bill cost of one hundred and seventy two thousand. 
uh, 172 pound a square foot now. So like I say, that 175. So you know, even if we'd had bid on the basis and we'd won the site, and then we then we suddenly found C Link and went, oh no, it's actually more like 180, 185. Luckily, through that tendering process and through a good tendering process, we can get that back down to 170. 72 mm-hmm. which now i've got to somehow manage to uh get that value back to um close to whatever it is so it looks like somewhere like 34 and a half percent or whatever's going to get close to, to what that value is based on um that bill cost and ultimately that hopefully sort of just i just wanted to try and bring it to life around those those steps you know we know people are going to be bidding on those sites what are, the, what are those values going to be? And I know there's a few questions around that, so we will open it up to a Q&A in a second around how we can, um, you know, where we, where we want to pitch some of those bill costs at at the moment. But you can certainly see for a scheme like this, uh, which I'd appreciate, I wonder if there's some elevations or something, elevation one as proposed. Um, so certainly for a scheme, you know, which essentially just looks like a very large house with a lot of windows and probably a lot of internal walls and a lot of bathrooms and everything else um it's coming out of that 175 you know one 180 ish um bill cost and like you say and those prices paul they are prices as of as of now aren't they yeah yeah um so you can see how that works so right through then you know to, to bring it through from from finding that site and like you say you know that one there has progressed but this one here actually when we look at the planning um is also um same sort of thing um has been knocked down and converted um into a three-story apartment with three-story development with nine apartments um, i think this one was only seven um but like i said if you want to try and find that next one you know we have tools like the strategies the development plots that say well look here are all the large gardens where we think it's potentially going to work and now you can then really start focusing in on trying to find that next scheme and doing something very similar um and ultimately making sort of this level of kind of profit against these kind of kind of land values. Maybe house prices have gone up since 2017, so maybe you wouldn't quite pay this anymore, but you can still see that's an extremely healthy margin um, on a site like that down in Croydon. Um, and that's regardless of whether you're looking for plots of land to build houses, you know, I know there's, uh, you know, ceiling obviously does renovations as well, and, and, and obviously we can help you find those or, you know, commercial to residential opportunities and, and all of that kind of stuff, shops with uppers, um you know imagine if we go more closer into the the high street we can find those and these are all commercial to residential opportunities as well so really nice and straightforward um and basically to summarize that before we then get into the q a how does nimbus help obviously we've gone through um a lot of the, the ceiling side nimbus helps by helping you find those sites um you know we like to think we can you can find that site in 90 seconds um, and I can quite happily demonstrate that, but we are running out of time. We can have you assess that site. What are those constraints? What are those revenues on there? Um, obviously, with that bill cost and refining that, you know, we can help you find developers and builders in the area if you're looking for those contractors, um, you know, to work on a more sort of design and build basis, or if you want to go down and maybe a bit more of a self-build route, you know, working with someone like Sealink. But we'll also then help you find those land and property owners and then planners and all that kind of stuff if you want to then help getting the planning. Um, and that's a lot of the site finding is done through these Elite Plus packages. So depending on what kind of strategy you're focusing on, we've got a package then to help you find those opportunities. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this is the final, final day of the Black Friday, Cyber Monday slash Tuesday Um deal that we have at the moment so depending on that level of package it's either a hundred pound a month 200 pound a month if you want one of those packages around finding commercial conversions residential land and airspace or hmos and then finally if you want all of those and all the strategies to find everything you could possibly want and then that's 275 pound a month and that is running today so if you do want to um, book in with the team I would suggest you um, do that sooner rather than later. Uh, what I will do is I'll put it um, in the chat to everyone. Um, use that link to go through to there. And not only that, obviously, yeah, we have fantastic um, trust pilot reviews. Um, you know, we're trusted by thousands of developers and investors now. Um, and yes, it is definitely a tool to help you out if this is the kind of work you're doing. But not only that, 
also C-Link is a key part of that toolbox as well, isn't it? Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I don't know, do you want to talk through this one, Paul? Absolutely, yeah, by the, by the, by the same token. Um, for anybody who is um, here and who has access to um, our our website, so that, that link, I can post that in as well. So if you want to have a demo of our um, product, if you um, book in for a demo in the next 24 hours before the end of um, tomorrow, then we will definitely have a 10% discount available for you guys as well. So I would uh, very much welcome talking to anyone. Fantastic. Excellent. So that leaves us to opening up to the Q&A section. Here so we go. Oh, we were trying to keep it to an hour. Um, so yes, for everyone who's got questions, we'll, we'll go as long as we can. I know I've got um, a little bit of extra time. So um, let's see if we can get through as many of these questions as we can. So I can see there are some in the Q&A and there's also some in the chat. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, start in the Q&A, but I will get to the chat. So I know people like to keep posting the question over and over again, but we'll get through to them all. Uh, Mario has asked, uh, I missed the source of the information about building material price rise. Uh, which government department was that? I don't know whether you can remember. The 23%, I guess that is. That was the, it's a long name, but it is the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the BEIS. And it was their monthly report in October, um, which covered the September period. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Tom's asked, what are your thoughts on the use of price adjustment clauses or fluctuation clauses in contracts to, defense, to defend against rising costs? Uh, well, I, I can say that we've never really done this in a land contract, so this is probably what I've negotiated, but I suppose obviously you, Paul, I don't know whether these are a common thing in um, procurement contracts. I mean, they are relatively, you can have fluctuation uh, clauses in, Typically, fluctuation clauses are on the larger contracts. So you're talking about, for example, the Olympics or let's say Crossrail, which is a project going on for 10 years. There has to be some provision for fluctuation in the event that they sign a contract in 2012 and in 2021, this happens. So it's typical for those kind of contracts. What I would say in the SME sphere is my personal belief is you're going to pay for it one way or the other because not many small businesses are going to be able to take the impact of a 20% increase. So it's, I would actually say that you're better off front end managing your procurement and having open conversations with very good specialists who can talk to you about tactics in value engineering. So perhaps reducing the amount of insulation or those kinds of things. But I don't think that there is a simple answer. And I see it from the other side with lots of subcontractors putting into their quotes that, they do not accept any responsibility for fluctuations in price. So I don't think there's a smart contract clause that is going to get you uh, through this, if that's if yeah, that makes sense. There's no, there's no uh, quick, simple answer to that. Um, okay, fantastic. Brian's asked, self-build approach sounds good, but for the inexperienced developers, isn't it difficult to obtain funding? I think we probably covered that unless there's anything else you want to add on on the funding i think for that i know you um, said yeah no i think we've touched on it what i will say is that um the advice that i was given was that you will be seen much more favorably self-build if some construction resource is not even necessarily employed but like a consultant project manager but they are invested in the project as well so whether that's a kind of small profit share or something like that then you are looked on very favorably Okay, fantastic. Um, clearly, uh, you're, you're the popular one here, Paul, but I, I figured that might be the case. First time for everything, Andrew. <laughs> uh, do you use build costs, pound per square foot, or pound per square meter for renovations and new build? How do you see these uh, moving and where do you get the data from? Um, do you use build costs? So is, is that more, I guess, can you get bill costs for renovations as well as new build? Maybe? Our co our, I mean, yes, you can. Our cost planning tool is um, largely focused on apartment buildings for the moment. Um, and it's based on the data that we have based on. So I showed you an example of people actually pricing. We have hundreds of contractors pricing. So we have live cost data. So the database is our own. 
and um, or the data set is our own and that's where our data is coming from. In terms of square foot or square metre, you get an overall price forecast. So I think it's 1.3 million in our example. And then you can divide that by the GIA in square foot or square metre. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Gary, on a similar sort of note, what would you currently suggest is appropriate for a standard two-storey housing scheme excluding abnormals? <laughs> Clearly got a very specific uh, example here, Gary. <laughs> uh, what would you say? <laughs> 20 plots, two, three and four beds, all between 800 and 1,200 square feet. Um, you know, what would be a, a sort of indicative price for that i suppose it depends where you are in the, in the country gary yeah. that's, that's the one thing you missed off but um it depends where you are it depends on the um spec. what what you're actually trying to achieve what i will say is i'd be more than happy to have a conversation with gary or have a separate conversation with gary where we actually have a look at what we think it would cost yeah okay fantastic um and I suppose an anonymous uh, question, which maybe sort of hangs off the back of it before we get to the next one. Um, how does your average costs come out against BCIS? I don't know, is that an exercise you undertake, Paul? Uh, it's not an exercise that we have done because we know our, our numbers are fat. It's what is going through our system. Um, BCIS, very good tool. I'm not going to downplay it, but what I will say is that it's not based on, it's always shifted by a quarter. Um, and it's always then got um, some indexing and factoring in it. We have some of that as well for different locations, but um, ours is based on actual costs here mm. and now. I think the I think that certainly anyone any Nimbus users there, you know, will sort of experience that. You know, a lot of the elite strategies with the, the appraisals in there. A lot of those are using BCIS figures, and, and obviously, given the, the the dramatic changes, then you know we, we get a lot of comments saying, "Oh, you know, that bill cost doesn't seem quite right in that area." Um, and that's just you know we can't physically keep updating it quick enough, you know, to um, to reflect that. So, um, yeah, I suppose, like I say, you know, you don't need to compare against any benchmark. You'll just you know, you're all you're bothered about is is the actual costs. Um, I have a site with planning in a high street ready, and I'm looking for a contractor to complete the project. Does your pl platform help you find contractors? That's T Palmy. Yes. Yeah, we have hundreds of contractors um, who would be interested. Fantastic. Uh, and Trevor Wilcock, what areas do you cover? I'm assuming that's to you because that name does ring a bell with me. So um, I, I suppose very quickly, if it is Nimbus, then we're England and Wales. Um, but if it's C-Link, yeah, I guess, how far do you So go? for C-Link, um, so the software is and the contracts within the software and the reading, the drawings, et cetera, et cetera, um, can be used to cover nationwide. Um, and you can actually upload your own subcontractors or contractors if you have them and manage them through the system. In terms of our own supply chain, we are covering currently London, the Southeast, and up towards the Midlands. Um, we are currently, or in 2022, doing a big push in uh, East and West Midlands, and then we will be going into the North in the second half of next year, if not before. So currently, London and the Southeast is very well covered, and we're continuing to cover um, Southwest and beyond. Fantastic. Um, over into the chat, we've got, uh, does your planning tool on ceiling, cost planning tool, sorry, uh, in ceiling factor in prices across different UK regions? I suppose that's half answered. Yeah, yeah it does, yeah. Um, and then uh, are your level of costs just material and labour? Does it include the contractor developer margins as well? Yeah, so it's... Uh... It's, it's the actual cost of what you're going to spend. And it includes prelims and contingency as well. Okay. At roughly 9%, 10%. Um, do you need to be a member to get the indicative cost breakdown? That's from Nick. Nope. You can access it. Um, Ceiling.com forward slash cost dash planning dash tool. Uh, fantastic. Uh, okay. Can you... I'll put that in the chat, actually. Uh... Can you kindly add in the finance cost element and also provide a projection of how long it will take to complete? I mean, so that's from Sunil. Um, I think Sunil, it was just trying to give a bit of a, a bit of colour on on how those bill costs might work through that journey. Um, yes, you know, this wasn't meant to be an exercise to try and sort of give a full detailed appraisal with um, with time scales and all of that kind of stuff. But um, I suppose if there is a bit of a demand for that, um, you know, it's a balance of trying to get 
some good, you know, rich detail in here, but also then trying to make sure it is it is a webinar and it's going to be light enough to, you know, to be uh, enjoyed by a number of people as well. So if there is a, a big demand for lots of really detailed appraisals and that sort of thing, then maybe we can have a look at that um, in the future as well. So now. Um, uh, so now, including the lender fees, honestly, back to the and sell off the units. So, so, so clearly, Sunhill was the one that was keeping me uh, on my toes with my keeping sharp. With Good my, on you, Sunhill. <laughs> <laughs> with my with my land fees and and, uh, and my selling fees and all that kind of stuff. So yes, you know, I, and SDLT taxes. Yes, okay, thank you, Sunhill. <laughs> um, like if I was in the example you're showing as a self build, does your cost tool factor in the legal? Okay, right, Nicola. Everyone's everyone's asking me about the, all these um, legal estate and consultancy costs, but I suppose for your um, cost tool, Paul, I suppose you're not including those. We are simply fees. talking about the cost of construction. I'm just the QS, and I, all I understand yeah. is construction. I'm afraid, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I mean, you know, that might be something I might look at in terms of maybe a blog or something on on typical sort of fees with all these kind of mm -hmm. things. So if you if there is a lot of questions around these, um, okay, clearly, yeah, Jeremy also telling me to add in some extra costs and and everything else. Okay, thank you. Um, cost buying tool I suppose that is to be honest I think the, the the point they're trying to make which is a very good point and I'll maybe just briefly share my screen again um, you know this was a very simple breakdown you know we're not I'm not here trying to you know I appreciate we're probably full of developers who have who have developed out a lot of sites but I think that the key point here which I probably haven't fully taken into account is obviously this is just your your supers and your foundations isn't it really um it's Build not cost yeah yeah so so the, the the cost that you're doing there that that's your but it's everything it's everything full in the fit out. full fit full fit out yeah would it include like mains in terms Absolutely. of roads yeah. services everything okay okay so it's not quite as far so the only thing then would be planning costs um and abnormals and um and all that kind of stuff as well whoops um i clearly can't spell there we go and abnormals so things like um as i think uh was it jeremy there who, who pointed out like sill yeah and any section 106 costs or if there's suddenly there's a whole lot of asbestos in the garden that needs clearing out obviously we haven't factored in any of that kind of stuff so yes there is you know and that's maybe why you know this particular person who bought that site maybe they didn't make 35 percent profit because it was built on a swamp and they had to do a whole load of extra abnormal works or the you know the nearest substation was two miles away and they had to you know pull a cable from quite far or something you know we we don't obviously don't know that but that's where through a combination of, of nimbus we can tell you obviously whether it's in a flood zone and, and lots of other constraints as well but um but likewise it isn't just simply get the figure from C-Link, get your revenues and, 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 and go with that. But it is, this is just meant to be a very high level, just, you know, are we in the right kind of ballpark? You know, and ultimately if someone said, look, if you give me 900,000 for this site, does that work for you? We're probably unlikely to get a lot of abnormals. Again, with the planning, we could very easily um, look in here and ultimately find, um, uh, you know, whether there is any sill within Croydon and all that kind of stuff. I have to say, I, I don't know Croydon, so I don't know. Um, but yes, you know, there, there is definitely all of that to, to, to factor in. Um, and clearly, yes, we've got a very, uh, a lot of very knowledgeable people here. So someone else is saying utility costs. Uh, but utility costs that you're saying they're included, Paul? Um, let me just have a quick look. Yeah, so we've got... Um... Yes, we have got the utility costs in here. It's all it's all relatively broken down within the. Um, it covers off both shell and core, then the fit out, and then you also have life cycle costs as well and the uh, contingencies and prelims. But I suppose yeah, like I said, the, the key thing really this is just to give you a flavour. You know, go and obviously have a look. You can see the full breakdown and see what it includes and what it doesn't include. There's of course an interesting one here is from Kelvin. I've just tendered a six house scheme in Croydon. Three small main contractors price similar houses to 43 um, Downs View or whatever it was called, Downs Way that we, where we did here, all above £200 um, pound per square foot. Mm. 
my appraisals are currently making me very nervous. But maybe Kelvin uh, having a call with Paul might uh, might help uh, a little bit on that as well. But I suppose that is that difference with the main contractor. This is, I suppose, a more of a self uh, managed route, isn't it, by getting different contractors in for yeah. from those different elements, isn't it? Um, and I think we might have covered it. Just can ceiling deal with airspace development? Yes. Yeah, it can. Yeah. Fantastic. I think we've covered everything. Yes, obviously, and maybe we probably skipped over this a bit too much, but again, another one here, again, from Jamie. So to be honest, yes, thank you, everyone. Um, you know, clearly everyone is uh, very detailed driven um, and, you know, we were trying to keep it a bit sort of high level, but um, like I say, uh, in your assumption, does it include professional fees, project manager, building control, site insurance, um, CDM, all of that kind of stuff, I suppose. There's, there's a... Nine ten percent allowance for preliminaries and contingencies, yes. So there is bits in there. Yeah. So I suppose, like you say, Jamie, Jeremy, Kelvin, all of the, you know, everyone, um, I think Anwar's and Sunil and everyone else, uh, Patsy, who all these people who were picking up all of those little details, like you say, it's understanding you'll you'll probably have your own appraisals. We're not trying to tell you to rip all those up. It's just then another way of saying, well, look, rather than just sort of saying, well, I've I've got a main contractor, that's the bill cost. There are obviously other alternatives mm -hmm. out there to then um, to try and you know reduce down those bill costs um, accordingly. So I think oh we've got a whole lot more in the Q and A. If everyone is still good for time, we do seem to have a lot of people on. Are you still good for time, Paul, as well? I've got till three thirty. Yes. Okay. Right. So we've got uh, what areas do you cover? We've covered. Philip has asked: Is the use of JCT contracts limiting progression towards leaner construction? What are the alternatives? Ooh. Oh, that is a good question. Um, we did a podcast on this three weeks ago or two weeks ago with a very, very interesting lady who um, her view was that construction contracts should only be 500 words long. She was being a bit facetious, but JCT is 50,000. Um, she was saying you want to be aiming closer to two, 3,000 words only. I personally think that the JCT is li limiting some progression towards uh, leaner construction. I think. Uh, we have one of our template contracts is 3,000 words. I think that's great. Both sides really like it. Challenge we have, um, I don't know if there is any development finance people in here, is that the development finance uh, still heavily relies on the JCT. And that is for obvious reasons. It's the in industry standard. But again, being more entrepreneurial about it, I would say that there are many ways that you can be leaner and achieve leaner uh, construction costs and we see it happening constantly yeah yeah okay that means nothing to me but jc jc you're better off not knowing about the jct Andrew. <laughs> okay well for those <laughs> there's your answer but for anyone else then uh, stay clear of them uh rooftop development airspace development that's mm -hmm. uh, from max yes um uh, Anastasia, again, I think this is more um, scrutiny over my uh, headline appraisal here. Bill cost than 30% margin. Uh, it's 20% profit, 10% planning, 10% consultants, 5%. You've got to improve that Excel spreadsheet, Andrew, for next time. I know, clearly, clearly. Um, uh, you know, I thought I'll just keep it very high level and, and clearly uh, we've got a, very, a lot of very good developers here. So um, is the oh sorry she's also got uh planning fees finance fees utilities warranties okay so you just everyone's listing out lot, all the bits that i've missed okay thank you uh Carl, <laughs> this is the final one um for residential development only i could provide cost estimates for other use classes so the ceiling cost plans all for the moment is just for residential development you can use ceiling the product for any kind of development if you actually want to procure but the cost plan all is limited to just residential for the moment okay um if it is self-managed you will have to add in the salary and profit share as a cost and the insurance for that if it's a self-bill yeah yeah i mean self-managed self -managed. Yeah, so if you're construction manager, well, that would be covered in the preliminaries um, allowance. And what you have to understand with that is you're paying for that one way or the other. There's you, you either pay for that for your own project manager who does loads of other things for your business and you've recruited and gone through that process or you do it, you pay all of that for the main contractor's project manager plus the profit for that. And 
this is why it's something I'm quite passionate about because many, many times, I'm sure there's people in here who would have been on a project and been frustrated with the management that's on their project and thinking that it doesn't quite, it's not getting them where they want to get, get to. So again, you'll, you pay for that. Either you think about it or you don't think about it. I would advocate for if you can think about it, manage it yourself and it's still covered by that prelims allowance whether you pay it to yourself or you pay it to a manga driver yeah don't get me started Andrew. Just don't get me started <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I you know I, the, the, you know the, the principle like I say is there it's it but it is taking on an element of risk you know like you say if those definitely come up then you know you're on the hook for them not that mains contractor you know that the, there always is a balance there isn't there um and I suppose I think that has covered everything oh, oh no we've got one more uh how have your cost planning been used for valuation of viability instead of an independent qs looks like it could be useful for that um i'm not 100 percent sure i know that um one of the brokerages who we have a relationship with is now using it as a further means of viability testing um for all of their um, appraisals yeah yeah okay well um yeah, I suppose it is It is quite an interesting one for that, to be honest, um, certainly on viability. I suppose ultimately it's just a nice, easy way of then just pulling in a load of contractors. So you've got, you know, just great evidence then, haven't you, to, to go there rather than just saying, you know, we've we've got in the market and the market says roughly this, you know. Um, and uh, Kareem, what level of deviation uh, would you expect if a project-specific detailed quantity survey was made? Hold on. In your cost estimate, what level of deviation you'd expect if a project-specific detailed quantity surveyor was made? Survey. Um, I suppose, do you expect much deviation from those costs? I suppose it depends from on the, the From the cost manager. Uh, it's a difficult question to answer. What I will say is that... Um, obviously, the cost planning tool is a 10-question survey. So there would be... There is only so much you can do with that information. Um, I'm not sure that I have the perfect answer for that um, right now, um, to be honest with you. Uh, but it's the idea is that if we go back to our example, you are not just saying £175 a square foot. You're actually saying, OK, it's in Croydon and it's 30th of November 2021. What actually do we think it is for that area right now? Should give you a better example of it. What I will say is that it includes some assumptions in there based on the data that we have but that you would we would forecast that you would be able to save through competitive tendering on the portal thereafter at least five percent yeah okay fantastic right i'm definitely going to draw a line under there um because i think we've covered everything although i can probably see everyone sort of sighing because they're not going to uh i wasn't going to mention it but i am uh what's your podcast paul there's a lot of requests for the podcast i've just put it on there so it's called the own the build podcast um and we uh we release every monday um morning at nine o'clock and it's on apple spotify google everything you have but i've, li I've linked you there on uh, buzzsprout and then you can just click through to whichever platform you most like fantastic excellent Right. Uh, and then there's a lot of thank yous coming through. So I was going to say, I am going to close it there because otherwise. <laughs> but, um, but I think that that does demonstrate with a lot of questions. Um, it's clearly a lot of, a lot of um, you know, a bit of a sense of subject for everyone at the moment around those bill costs. Um, so I want to thank you for a fantastic presentation, Paul, and, um, and thanks for all your input today. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks everyone for all the questions. It's nice to, uh, nice to be asked. Fantastic. And also a thank you from me, everyone. Um, this has been another um, Nimbus Maps Partnership webinar um, and we're running these every sort of um, week. So do check in for next week's one. But other than that, I wish you all the best and we'll hopefully see you all very soon. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye bye now. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Andrew. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.